Hey you and welcome, my name is Mike, and in this old podcast, I'm telling you the story of a man, a, a big guy, a, a big guy for you. And with the name John Edward Robinson, you can probably see that coming. What you can probably also see coming is that he is going to be one big old bitch. What you may not see coming, <laughs> um, how about the, the gimp masks, the strap-ons, and the International Council of Masters? Now I know that sounds pretty cool, but, but you'll be surprised. So, so look forward to that. This lad has gone down, downtown, as the internet's first number one serial killer. <laughs> Well, look at you. You know, at least he's, he's number one in something. Pretty close to being number one in just all round piece of crap. Another name for him was the Slave Master, which whenever I hear that kind of name, it's very hard not to laugh because, because it's just, it's pretty ridiculous. And it's very, very funny to like for some kind of internet sex guy to be like, I'm the Slave Master. And then it's like, oh, really? You? I mean, this guy, he looks like 10 pounds of sausage in a five pound bag. As far as, you know, internet BDSM uh, names go, you know, you really, really do got to give yourself a cool ass name. Like if, if I, if I, for example, hypothetically was going to be on one of these forums, wink, wink, I'd call myself something like, something like the Taint Tickler, you know, something cool like that. I mean, Slave Master? It's not great, really. It's just ridiculous. What wasn't, though, was John Boy, Booby, who, in the Kansas City area, committed a series of murders, a fairly, a fairly long series of murders, using internet chat rooms as his prowling ground. He was also a serial fraudster, thief, embezzler, among other things. It's, it's quite a ride he had before it came to a sudden stop. There's a lot to get into. This, this will be a long one, so strap yourselves in. So let's do just that. Let's give it a go. In June 2000, cop cars swarmed a trailer park in Kansas and dragged a bedraggled John Robinson out of his home. They had been tracking him for years. He'd been on and off the radar. But finally, it was time. And soon, in oil drums, they would find the various women he had hired over the years, who would nearly always, suddenly, write to their families saying they never wanted to see them again. The story of John Robinson, it, it's long though, so let's, let's go back and begin at that dang old beginning. Born two days after Christmas 1943 in Cicero, Illinois, John Edward Robinson had like almost the, the cliche serial killer start in life. An alcoholic father, Henry, and an overbearing strict mother with a violent temper, Alberta. And I mean, come on, like with a name like that, yikes, like, no wonder. At age 12, Robinson joined the Boy Scouts and was heavily involved with the Catholic Church, so much so that the next year, he'd enroll on a five-year course at Quigley Preparatory Seminary School with the hope of eventually becoming a priest at the end of his studies. That same year, he became an Eagle Scout. Apparently, he loved the attention, and he, he took like the ceremony way too seriously. He would brag about his new position. Hey, everybody, I'm an Eagle Scout. I don't care. Like, if that isn't a massive kind of red flag, I don't know what is, but that's a red flag he will be routinely throwing up as we go through this story. But, as we see, you know, the very first tiny bit of power Robinson got, he milked it, like, to the nines. As part of his Eagle Scout duties, he was part of a small delegation that flew to England and were presented to Queen Elizabeth II. More attention for this fucko. Robinson would later claim in many interviews that throughout his time, he was being constantly abused by his mother. According to Robinson, she would shout insults at him for, for no reason whatsoever. And if she felt he'd even looked at her the wrong way, she would straight up beat the living shite out of him. And no surprises for him being a big ol' s and fan later in life, I suppose. At Quigley, the partying, the partying priest school, his studies were not going well at all. Um, this is something that comes up again and again with him. We'll see this multiple times. If it didn't come easily to him, he, he simply didn't bother, essentially, 
it, it, it was either this is going to be, you know, clean sailing or just not having it. Nah, just not having it. He was in constant trouble and would not stop getting into petty arguments that often escalated into physical fights with fellow students. So, like, kind of sounding like the opposite of a priest. He was like an all-round disruptive influence and spent as much time in detention as he did in lessons. As a result, he would leave Quigley at the end of only his, his freshman year. In 1961, a 17-year-old Robinson enrolled at the Morton Junior College in Cicero, a Chicago suburb, initially hoping to become an X-ray technician. <laughs> However, no surprise, it didn't take long for Robinson's delusional self-view to overtake his actual abilities once again, and he adjusted his, his realistic plan to the much less likely plan to qualify as a doctor instead, from x-ray technician to full-on physician. Unsurprisingly, Robinson's plan wouldn't last and he dropped out after two years at Morton. So, priest, x-ray technician, doctor, shithead? Three years later, in 1964, Robinson moved to Kansas City, Missouri where he met and married Nancy Jo Lynch. This uh, kind of sort of seemed to, to spur him into action, as over the next year, Robinson would find a job as an x-ray tech at Children's Mercy and General Hospital, downtown Kansas City. B -b 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 but he didn't even f -f finish his studies. I hear you barking, big dog. Well, see, Johnny Boy didn't need that, not when he could just draw up the diploma himself. Like, uh, <laughs> drawn up in crayon. I mean, I mean, sure, right, sure, he didn't have the degree truthfully, but he did have the degree lifely. He even, he even went so far as to fake recommendation letters from Morton, the college he attended for less than two years. Man, back in the day, it was just so easy to fake this shit. Good times. Now, he told the hospital he was studying to become a doctor, and he, he just needed a night job to get him through his studies. Sadly for Robinson, it's not as easy to fake being x-ray tech as it is to, to fake some certificates and John would be discovered and fired fairly quickly. I mean, the staff realized, you know, it didn't take him too long to realize he actually had no idea how to work the x-ray machines. I mean, right, if you're going to lie your way into a job, at least, you know, it might actually help if you know how to do it so you aren't discovered, like, immediately. And in a piece of glorious timing, this was right before Nancy would give birth to the couple's first child, John Jr. in 1965. Not that, not that this like seminal, you know, very important life event met, meant literally anything to Robinson, who would who was known to be constantly cheating on Nancy and would like regularly leave her to go look after the newborn while he was out, he was out party, he was having a grand old time, he was going out to clubs with his, his many girlfriends. Very nice. The next year, Robinson managed to, he managed to blag himself another x-ray tech job at the Foundation Plaza X-ray Laboratory under a Dr. Wallace Graham. He's the Michelangelo of bullshitting this guy. How, again, he managed to blag his way to this job? It's impressive, I'll give him that, you know, uh, and Robinson, he took full advantage of his new position. And by taking advantage, I mean stealing and embezzling thousands of dollars from the practice's accounts. Just, just six months, after just six months into the job, he completely emptied them of funds. I mean, how did he gain access to all of this and how they didn't notice? The answer to that is, again, back in the day. Good, good times, good times. For some, not all. For Robinson, for sure. He was also known to be sleeping with several patients and co-workers at this time. He went so, uh, so far as to brag to his boss's 15-year-old son about all the shit he was up to and all his sexual exploits. I mean, he was like, what a cool guy, you know, that, that feels the need to impress a 15-year-old. That's the kind of guy John Edward Robinson was. The only people he could impress were children. He's pretty cool. Somehow, Robinson managed to fly under the radar for three whole years, during which time Nancy would give birth to the couple's second child, a daughter named Kimberly. As was always the case with John, his shady actions eventually came to light and the walls fell in on him. Oh no, the consequences of my actions! 
He was ultimately arrested and charged with embezzling $33,000 from Dr. Graham and his practice. He was convicted on theft charges and got three years probation. So, I mean, hey, come on, probation after this, right? He need, he really needed to keep his nose, nose clean for at least the next couple of years if he, if he wanted to stay out of prison. Let's see if that happened. In 1970, less than a year after receiving probation for the embezzlement of $33,000, Robinson would be arrested again. This time for stealing 6,200 stamps. Yes, stamps from the Mobile Oil Company, where he'd been working for a short time. Now, he got fairly lucky and he managed to make a deal with the prosecutor, offering to repay what he'd stolen and in return, the charges would be dropped to a misdemeanor, and that would keep him out of jail. So, you know, what should have been a positive step for John and his family, um, he managed to make a total, total mess of it. You know, like, he's given this opportunity to kind of, you know, fly right. But John, he took that opportunity, bundled it up into his hands, and just threw it over his shoulder. So what he did next was, he accepted work selling insurance for the Orby Jones Company. And in order to accept the job, John took his family to live in Chicago, where the company was based. This, moving to Chicago from uh, Kansas City, just so happened to be a direct violation of his probation conditions. And to make matters worse, John didn't even bother to tell his probation officer. And the thing is, though, he was actually doing really well in this new job. I mean, it seems if John was anything, a natural salesman would be it. A full-on bullshitter, for sure. Unfortunately, he was also a natural-born idiot and a thief, and so he helped himself to over $5,000 from Orby Jones' company. Once again, he was arrested, he was charged, and in a stroke of luck, John was able to strike a deal to drop the charges on the condition that he pay restitution. Yet again, this is like, how many times has he been arrested? Ah, just don't worry about it, you know, I'll drop the charges and I'll pay it back, wink wink. Like, shortly after, the Jackson County Court in Kansas also ordered Robinson to return to the state and for his probation to be doubled from the original three years to six. So, with little choice, John complied with the order. He returned the family to Kansas, um, relocating to a bigger house in Missouri after Nancy gave birth to twins, Christopher and Christine. He's now been arrested twice. Three times, actually. He's been arrested three times. Basically has done nothing like, no time, no consequences for any of them. What do you, like, what do you think that would happen to a, a career criminal, essentially? It won't make them get better, anyway. It just teaches them, shit, I can get away with anything. That's exactly what happened to John. See, he then, then what John did was set up his own company, a medical consulting business called Professional Services Association, Inc., which... <sighs> What a name. It could literally be anything. I think that's like the most generic name for a company ever. Definitely not a scam. Incorporated. And again, someone with no credentials, a history of lying, but goddamn, could J.E. or bullshit with the best. Using this company, John managed to get a gig with the University of Kansas Medical Center as a business consultant for its family practice department. Again, how he managed to get into these like universities and hospitals with literally no proof of doing anything so mad for one man but again as we've seen before it didn't take long for people to realize he didn't have a clue what he was doing and he would raise suspicions by uh, apparently requesting the company's checkbook like literally just asking for the keys to their bank account at this point he was caught in his latest fraud after he forged a whole bunch of letters attempting to validate his own company's status. This led him to appear in front of a federal grand jury in Missouri, where he was indicted on charges of securities fraud, mail fraud, and for falsely misrepresenting PSA Inc., Professional Services Association, the most prestigious company in Missouri. He ended up entering a plea of no contest in return for a $2,500 fine and another three years on probation, which brought his running total up to nine years. So again, that's four times. Still, just probation. That's all he's gotten, which is essentially a get-out-of-jail-free card for a guy like John. Over the next year, he kept kept himself busy, you know, rebuilding his life. The, the family moved to a new house, and John 
wormed his way into a scoutmaster position with the local the local scouts. He also coached a t-ball team, he refereed volleyball games, and got an occasional position as a Sunday school teacher at a Presbyterian church. Like, he was really worming his way into the local community being, hey, listen, I'm just a good old-fashioned, you know, guy who wants to participate and help the kids. I'm a community guy at heart. Doing all this while still being on probation for multiple thefts and embezzling tens of thousands of dollars. He was even named Man of the Year by a charity for less abled people, of which he'd managed to wrangle himself a role onto their board of directors. Amazingly, like while he was on this board of directors, he used this position to order supplies that enabled him to forge a letter from the executive director to the mayor and further letters from the mayor to other notable local figures and civic leaders. Like he was writing letters, pretending to be the mayor, doing all this sort of stuff. And the letters were to invite the recipients to the charity's presentation of their Man of the Year award. Now, just to say, the Man of the Year award didn't actually exist. John made it up in order to present it to himself. I'm not, I'm not just great. Uh, and it was complete with an awards lunch, you know, in his own honor. Like, this is the Oscars or something. Like, if only all of Robinson's crimes had been as harmless and ridiculous as this one, they were not. And he hasn't, he hasn't even killed anyone yet. Well, at least that we know of. I mean, he was such a, he's such a goddamn criminal, though, from head to toe. His deception, it was once again quickly realized when the people whose names he'd forged in the letters read about the award in the paper and they were like, I am not endorsing, I never endorsed this asshole. But this is just like when he became Eagle Scout all over again, you know. Am and I just great? And of course, during this time, John was beating Nancy and generally making life hell for his family. Uh, he purchased two horses uh, short, for a short while and was ne neglecting them completely. Like all, all in all, his behavior was becoming more and more selfish and more and more cruel. He also set up a new hydrophonics company called Hydro Grow in which he persuaded a friend who needed fast money to pay for his dying wife's medical care to invest $25,000 of his life savings into the new business. Like, obviously, John was saying, give me your life savings and I'll give it back to you three times more. John being John, he took the money and his friend got nothing and his wife, his dying wife never got that medical care. If you think, by the way, that's the lowest John Edward Robinson can go, think again, my friends. In March 1979, John, now aged 36, was finally discharged from federal probation, receiving a glowing, wow, glowing report from his probation officer. John celebrated his new beginning by immediately finding a new job as an employee relations manager at a company called Guy's Foods, where he took, <laughs> he took full advantage of his new position, uh, one, having an affair with his secretary, and to using her to help him embezzle tens of thousands of dollars by adding fake employees onto the payroll and cashing their checks. Rinse and repeat, this is like what he's done with every job so far. And as you can imagine, he was fired as a result less than a year later and charged with felony theft, submitting false vouchers and check forgery. He was ordered to pay over $41,000 in restitution. But John, he pushed his look a little too far in the autumn of 1981, when he cashed a false $6,000 check and, as a result of a guilty plea, received his very first custodial sentence, 60 days in jail, to be served from May 1982. Yeah. After all that, multiple frauds adding up to over $100,000, receiving f awards that don't exist, and all of the other shit he was doing. He got a whole, an entire, wow, we about 60 whole days in jail. Yippee. And not even prison. Jail. Like, <laughs> he was having a great old time. No wonder he thought he could get away with whatever he wanted. Like, shit, if, if that's all I got for what he did, like, why wouldn't you do what he was doing? You know, 60 days in jail for stealing over $100,000? There's no consequences to his actions whatsoever, so happy days, lads. After his release in the summer of 1982, John started his third company called Equiplus. Now, by this stage, Robinson, John Robinson, he had gained uh, himself quite a reputation in his neighborhood. He'd become notorious for his indecent proposals towards local women, and on at least one occasion, this led to a physical fight 
with an understandably very angry husband. Later, in the fall of 82, Robinson would meet a man named Irv Blattner. Now, you can probably guess with a name like that, he'll turn out to be one rat piece of shit. Though, I guess I shouldn't be attacking him because he ratted out John, who would go on to become Robinson's partner in crime over the next couple of years. Together, they would pretty much bin off Equiplus and start a new sister company called Equi2. These names are incredible, just setting up these phony companies so they could get away with whatever sinister shit they wanted to. And over the next few years, the two, they would run petty scams together under the guise of trying to get their legitimate business up and running. You know, the whole invest with me, help me, you know, making business proposals, invest in this company, blah, blah, blah. Never see your money again. But he seemed like such a nice boy. In May of 1982, Irv set Robinson up with a woman who was looking for a divorce. Irv introduced Robinson as an attorney who as a favor, would sort the divorce out for her if she just paid him $200 and signed her car over to him. Of course, John and Irv split the money and ran. I mean, really? Come on now. What do you think was going to happen? It's around this time, though, that things spiraled wildly, and John did away with what little control he'd had over his darker tendencies. By 1984, though, John, he was already 40 years old, so it's unlikely, you know, knowing what we know about serial killers, that John Edward Robinson really indeed wait till now to finally snap and start killing. But if he did, which could be the case, it definitely makes him a more interesting and unique case among serial killers. Like, they tend to start a good bit earlier than when he started, because, my friends, the story is going to get... Um... Uh, darker. <laughs> no other way of putting it. So, as I said, by now, in 1984, John, he had two shell companies on the go, which allowed him and Irv to run their various scams. John, he saw another opportunity, however, when he hired 19-year-old Paula Godfrey to work for him as a sales rep at Equi2. Not long after, Paula Godfrey told family and friends that Robinson had arranged for her to go away for training. Uh Uh-oh. He picked her up from her parents' home in Overland Park, Kansas, on the 1st of September, 1984. Then, after hearing nothing more from her, her parents became worried, and they contacted police to file a missing persons report. Several days after, police police officers, they interviewed Robinson, John Edward Robinson, about Paula Godfrey, and he told them that he had dropped her off at the airport. Didn't know where she went after she got out of the car. The old, yeah, dropped her off, never seen her again. Hey, I'm a victim here too, she just ditched me. Her family then received a typed letter, signed at the bottom, apparently signed by Paula. In the letter, she said, John Edward Robinson is such a great dude. My family, I'm happy, but I just don't ever want to see you ever again. Paula Godfrey, she was 19 years old, she was considered of legal age to make her own decisions, and police, they wouldn't pursue the matter any further. I guess it kind of goes without saying, though, my friends, Paula Godfrey was never seen from or heard from again. Now, also in 1984, Robinson used Equi2 to set himself up in a new business. Using the company's name, Equi2, John, he rented a duplex, and he turned it into a brothel specializing in bondage, S&M, and rough sex. He'd, he was now making the leap, you know, from nondescript businesses and general bullshit um, to hardcore stuff. But I guess that's just really what John Edward Robinson really loved. Hey, do you know what they say? Get a job doing what you love, you'll never have to work a day in your life. He hired a woman named Linda Stephen Jones to be the madame and take care of the day-to-day running of his new establishment, a brothel. In addition, he tasked her with finding and recruiting new girls to live and work at the brothel. Robinson, he also became active in a secretive S&M cult called the International Council of Masters, where he was known by the title of Slave Master for the very first time. Now, International Council of Masters my god, what a name. Like, with a name like that, it's like the Illuminati of Choke Me Daddy. This is incredible. I love, I just love that name. I picture, you know, a lot of people meeting at a circular table in, in some kind of bunker. All of them wearing nothing but gimp masks and strap-ons. As part of his duties, John, he would bring young girls to meetings to be used as victims of the 
International Council of Masters, uh, their beatings and various sexual assaults. Something, something that, you know, no doubt his connection to the brothel, which he owned, <laughs> came in handy, I guess. John was becoming more and more violent and more unhinged from the constraints of, of normal society. In 1985, Linda Stasi and her four-month-old daughter, Tiffany, they were staying at a women's shelter in Kansas City, where they met a well-dressed, non-threatening man named John Osborne. Osborne, he was launching his new program, the Kansas City Outreach Program. So, hey, Lee sent Tiffany they needed some help. Happy days. Lisa was an early participant in the program, and Osborne, John Osborne, he'd taken a shine to her, offering her a trip to Chicago for job training, and he even offered to pay for her room and her board. He sat her down prior to departure for the trip to Chicago, and he asked her if she'd sign some papers for him, so that, you know, he could use them to update her parents about how things were going for her. On January 9th, John Osborne picked Lisa and her daughter up from Lisa's sister Kathy's home, and he took them to a local hotel, the Roadway Inn. Sometime the next day, Lisa called her mother-in-law, Betty, and, and said something about they, telling her she wasn't a fit mother, and that they'd told her that Betty even wanted custody of Tiffany. Like, Lisa was saying this to Betty, so this was a bit out of the blue for Betty, who never wanted to take Tiffany from Lisa. Who they even were was a question mark. Lisa then said on this phone call, Here they come, before the call cut out and the line disconnected. Worried, Lisa's family, they called the roadway in, in Overland Park, but they were told by the staff there that Lisa and her baby had already checked out. They asked, you know, who would book the room, and they found that the name was not Osborne, as they were expecting, but was a name unknown to them, but well known to you and I. John Edward Robinson. The Stasis, they soon found out that local businessman, John Robinson, he had a business called Equi2, and so Lisa's brother-in-law went to the offices to confront, to confront John Robinson about where the hell Lisa was, what was going on, who's they, what's this job bullshit you're go going on. Apparently, though, he got nowhere speaking to John Robinson. And so uh, Lisa's own family and her in-law family, they went to the police. When the police approached John Robinson about Lisa, that her family was very worried, John spun them a whole tale about a mystery boyfriend named Bill coming over to the offices, picking up Lisa and Tiffany, and then they all left for Colorado. Never seen her again. She just ditched me. These stories are sounding, starting to sound familiar. But... Again, like with Paula Godfrey, there was no sign of him being dishonest. Police, they took him at his word, and they left. A few days later, just as with Paula Godfrey, a letter arrived at the home of the Stasis, typed and signed by Lisa. In the letter, Lisa said her and her new boyfriend, Bill, had taken Tiffany and were moving to Colorado to start a new life together. Now, her in-laws, in you know, immediately suspicious, knowing that Lisa didn't know how to type, and nothing about the letters, like nothing in the letters about her actions made any sense whatsoever. Unfortunately, the signatures were genuine, and so once again, with little else to go on, authorities failed to pursue the case any further, deeming the letters enough to indicate her and her four-month-old were, were fine and well. Now, you're probably thinking, oh hey, the signatures were genuine. How did he get that? Because this story is obviously bullshit. Well, you gotta remember, John Edward Robinson, expert forger. So, there you go. Either that or he had a gun to her head and made her sign it. So it's not really hard to guess what happened to Lisa Stasi after she left that hotel. But, what happened to Tiffany Stasi, who was her four-month-old daughter, is possibly even more messed up. See, John Edward Robinson knew that his brother and sister-in-law Don and Helen Robinson, they were desperate for a child, but they had been unsuccessful in conceiving. <laughs> what a bloke. Never one to miss a, a chance to make a quick, quick and devious dollar. John called his brother and he told them that he'd found them a baby that had been put up for adoption by the mother. And so, you know, John's brother and his wife, they were overjoyed by this. And so they set up uh, for Kansas from their home in Chicago immediately. And just two days later, they'd be driving the journey back to Chicago with their shiny new four-month-old in tow and forged 
adoption papers in hand. John, for his part in, uh, you know, facilitating the uh, quote-unquote adoption, was now five and a half grand richer. Both Lisa Stadzi's you know, blood family and her in-law family, they received further typed and signed letters, all on the same stationery, of course. And the police, once again, you know, they de just deemed it not suspicious enough to investigate and bother with. How incredibly messed up. But here, just to, to let you know uh, what exactly happened there, Tiffany Stasi, she would be renamed Heather Robinson and raised by Don and Helen Robinson. It wasn't until she was 15 years old she found out the adoption process her parents had her parents had always been very open with her about was way less normal than it should have been not only was the man she knew as uncle john in fact a vicious serial killer her own mother had been one of his victims like you can imagine trying to reconcile the truth with the loving family who raised her must have been i mean damn that's that's rough so back to John Edward Robinson and the various shenanigans he was up to. Finally, in March 1985, John's choice of business partners would come back to bite him in the arse uh, when Irv Blattner struck himself a deal with the actual real-life Secret Service, a deal that would keep him out of jail and land John right in his place. This part of the story is pretty wild, so uh, listen up, folks. And this is really the part in the story where John's luck should have run out, but, uh, well, you'll see. Blattner, right, he agreed to sign a statement that tied John Robinson to several of their illicit and illegal activities, all the various scams and shit they had been up to. On the 21st of March, as part of his regular visit to his probation officer, Stephen Hames, John Robinson was arrested on multiple charges. See. John's probation officer, Stephen Hames, he was a bit of a, he was ahead of the curve when it came to uh, John Robinson. He had caught on that, that, you know, something was wrong and he was investigating, um, what, his probatee? Uh, he was investigating him, like, through several lines of inquiry himself. One of those inquiries led him to discover John Robinson's connection to two missing women, Paula Godfrey and Lisa Stasi. So, uh, this probation officer, you know, with his suspicions in hand, Steve connected with a contact in the FBI and he asked, hey, are you guys looking into him? Maybe you should be. Now, the FBI weren't, but soon they would be. With the FBI on the case, it didn't take long for them to stumble across the Secret Services investigation into Irv Blattner and John Robinson's fraudulent activities. John, these two, Equa2, Equa Plus, whatever, these scam businesses, they had suddenly gone, they'd gotten on the radar of some um, law enforcement agencies. Sadly, there were no treads t uh, leading to the missing women. The investigations into these two guys, it wasn't about really their, well, especially into John Edward Robinson, it really wasn't about his, his extracurricular activities at all. The federal investigators, they focused largely on the falsifying of government checks by Blattner and Robinson, as well as several of their other less savory business adventures, but really, Falsifying checks, that was what landed them in the shit. Now, initially, the FBI, they considered using a female agent to pose as a potential sex worker, hoping to get employment in John Robinson's brothel. They even had the agent meet with Robinson under the guise, you know. But after hearing that Robinson expected her to be able to take pain, uh, including having <clears throat> pliers used on her nipples... The FBI immediately dropped the plan out of fear for her safety. Yeah, not worth it. I mean, it was an s &M brothel, but yeah, no. I don't think it's a good idea to send anybody in there. So what the FBI then did instead was contact John Robinson's business partner, Irv Blattner. They knew he would sell out Robinson to save himself, and so they approached him with a deal, and just as they thought, Irv Blattner jumped on it to throw his business partner, J.E. or John Edward Robinson, into the fire so he could save himself. The next part of the story is a little bit more insane, though, because that, that was, like, Irv Blattner would only sign a statement incriminating John Edward Robinson for all the shit, all their scams and illegal activities he was up to. But the FBI wanted a little bit more evidence against, against him. See, the FBI, they did have another, more trustworthy witness against Robinson. A young 21-year-old woman named Teresa Williams. 
Williams had come from Boise, Idaho, working odd jobs around Kansas City while she was, you know, just looking for a break. On her search, she was introduced to John Robinson, who offered her a rent-free apartment along with paid expenses and she would earn money from sex work. He would even hook her up with uh, amphetamines and weed to sweeten the deal. Wow. He's like, a, he's her daddy coming in. He's like her sugar daddy, you know, Pepper Jack. He's coming in and was going to provide it all for Teresa apartment, drugs and money. So in late April 1985, Teresa Williams was given $1,200 by Robinson, given a fancy dress, and she was picked up from the apartment he had set her up in. One day, a car pulled up for her. She was taken in a limousine, blindfolded, to a house she would later describe as a mansion where she met a man she knew only as the judge. This man led her to a BDSM basement playground full of various torture devices. He then put her on a rack and began to stretch her. I guess it goes without saying, this was the International Council of Masters. So, <laughs> unsurprisingly, Teresa Williams, she panicked, she broke out in tears, she was begging to let her go. She didn't sign up for this shit to be stretched on the rack like she's goddamn William Wallace and Braveheart. She was then blindfolded and badly shaken from the experience. She was driven back home. But when John Robinson found out about this, about what had happened, he was none, he was none too pleased with uh, Teresa Williams. After all, he was her sugar daddy and she wasn't playing ball. He demanded all the money back and he sexually assaulted her with a revolver. They later, they later made up, however, and Robinson told her he had a way to make it back up to him. As John Robinson, at this point, he was sure that his partner Irv was setting him up. John Edward Robinson, dickhead, but not an idiot. He had his suspicions that Irv was gonna was gonna set him up and and throw him into the into the fire in his in his place. But but I mean, how John Edward Robinson learned that his business partner was was a rat was betraying him, or whether he just guessed he got vibes, no one actually knows. So what Robinson did, he enlisted Teresa Williams in helping set up Irv Blattner first. He's like the deal Uno reverse card. He had her keep a diary, a fake diary, detailing fictional run-ins with Irv Blattner, and even the outlandish death threats he'd allegedly made. John Edward Robinson, he must have known they, that, you know, him and Irv had popped up on the radar of various law enforcement agencies. He knew Irv was going to betray him. And so he's like, well, I'll betray you first, buddy. So Teresa Williams, she was now telling all of this to the agents who were investigating John Robinson. Now, they had paid her a visit, hoping to get further incriminating uh, information about Robinson. And the reason she began telling all this was, well, when the law enforcement agents, they told her that John Edward Robinson was linked to two missing women. And so she was like, well, after he dropped her off at a mansion to be put on a rack, she might be next. So she also became a witness against John Edward Robinson. And she told the uh, law enforcement agents that his plan was, after framing Irv Blattner, Robinson was set to fake uh, Williams's murder and then take Teresa Williams to the Virgin Islands that she was going to fake her death Probably scratch out the fake part, though, and then he would allegedly move away out of the country. Now, agents knew straight away what John Edward Robinson's real plan would be, and they moved Teresa Williams into protective custody. They knew she wouldn't be around too much longer. They contacted Steve Hames, the probation officer, and they asked him to do his best to get John Edward Robinson's probation revoked. Hames, he used the gun possession and supplying drugs to Williams as grounds to get Robinson off the streets. Robinson appealed and he was let out on bail pending the results of his appeal and the charges would collapse when the FBI, fearing for Williams' life, kept her hidden and then ultimately gave her a ticket out of the state. Because of this, the Missouri Court of Appeals deemed that John Robinson's constitutional right to face his accuser had been violated. So once again, he got unlucky and gotten away with it at least, at least for the time being. And that was close as shit. So to sum up, the feds were investigating, investigating him. He had one partner betray him and sign a sworn statement saying he was up to all this shit. And then he had another, well, I guess she was a victim, ready to testify against him. 
but because they feared for her life, she couldn't, and then, kind of almost on a technicality, he got off scot-free. How he managed to get away with all of this shit is insane when he had all of these law enforce enforcement uh, agencies, like, he was in their crosshairs, and he still managed to walk. Come on now. It wouldn't be until 1987, when John was 43 years old, that he would finally do some proper prison time, when he received four years for multiple frauds. That would be, that would be the most he would receive after all those investigations. That's, that's all he got. He was actually convicted in January 1986, but it wasn't until all his appeals had been heard that he would finally rock up behind bars in Kansas in May 87. Now John, you know, in prison, he made the most out of his time. And John, while he was out on appeal before May 1987, he made, um, he had a grand old time as yet another young woman he employed disappeared. 27-year-old Catherine Clampett of Wichita Falls, Texas. She had answered an advert John Robinson had placed in the paper offering a, quote, great job, lots of travel, and a new wardrobe. On June 15th, her brother, Robert Bales, contacted the police after he hadn't heard from Catherine for, for several weeks. But yet again, yet again, Police couldn't find sufficient evidence to link Robinson to the woman's disappearance. So then, he went to, to prison and apparently he was an exemplary inmate during his sentence, using his, his charms to get by with other inmates and with guards. He was even given a job as coordinator of the prison's maintenance operations office. This was the first time John would get some hands-on experience with the prison's computer systems, and he even played a part in developing a program that saved the prison over $100,000 a year. Though he might, you know, have been well behaved in the system, uh, that's not to say though his time in prison was uneventful um, during his prison stint. His father died, and John Edward Robinson himself suffered several strokes that would leave one side of his face paralyzed and frozen. After serving his initial four-year sentence, John was transferred from Kansas to Western Missouri Correctional Prison to serve another three years for, for an earlier fraud. And it was here that John met and befriended the prison's librarian, 47-year-old Beverly Bonner, and her husband, and the prison doctor, William Bonner. And the Bonner is where just, well, gee shucks, take it in by Robinson's charm, Beverly especially so. And when John was finally released from prison in 1993, at the age of 49, Beverly divorced her husband and moved to Olath, Kansas. She told her now ex-husband she'd found a new job and would be traveling almost non-stop for work. She gave him a post box number he could use to mail her alimony checks as she traveled. Naturally, like, this is his... He uses the same shit again and again. After she left for work, Beverly Bonner was never seen from again. Though for years, her mother mailed her alimony checks to that P.O. box, and John, he would eventually... He made so much from the savings that these checks added up to, he was able to put down a $95,000 deposit on a house for his son, daughter-in-law, and their children. Well, at least he was using the money to help somebody, I suppose. In the summer of 1994, John used newspaper ads to lure in his next victim. When her husband died of cancer, Sheila Dale Faith was left on her own with her daughter, Debbie, who relied on a wheelchair due to being born with spina bifida. The two, they scraped by on Debbie's disability checks, and so Sheila thought she'd hit the lottery when she met John. Don't they all? John told her money, not an issue, and that he'd provide for her and Debbie, and he'd even take her on a cruise. Sheila and Debbie had planned to visit John in Kansas during their upcoming trip to Texas. They said, we're on our way to Texas anyway, we'll stop by. But instead, John was not waiting around. Instead, he drove down to Faith's home in Pueblo, Colorado, in the middle of the night. Again, the mother and daughter, they were never seen again. But there was little, little to nothing, actually, to connect them to John at the time. Just like he'd done with Beverly Bonner's alimony, he began uh, collecting Fate's uh, disability checks. No doubt, also probably giving that to the money he gave John Jr. Around this time, John and his wife moved into a new mobile home in Olath, Kansas. It's in Santa Barbara Estates. Ooh, sounds very fancy, you know, for a... I mean, it's a trailer park, but, you know. 
He was known in his neighborhood, though, as being, um, hmm. The neighbors quickly got, like, remember earlier on when he moved to this place in Missouri and he got involved with the Eagle Scouts and Sunday school and, um, you know, after school sports programs. This time he was cutting out all that shit. He just kind of, like, throughout John's life, as he gets older and older, he stops, he's removing the facade one bit at a time because he quickly became known in this neighborhood as the creepy guy. He had a reputation for slowly driving his golf cart past women's houses and looking in their windows when he knew their husbands or their partners were out. Ladies and gents, Manson lamps. He'd also spend the majority of his time in front of his five computer screens, fucking five of them, <laughs> he really didn't want to miss a thing, non-stop searching through various early BDSM sites online. And throughout this period, John was also engaging in several dominant submissive relationships with various women, and some of those relationships would last, lasted years. One of these was with an upper-class woman John had connected with through an advert in an uh, alternative magazine. At first, everything had gone well between the two, um, though, you know, like, though what might have transpired between them would be con considered maybe a little bit extreme, it was always consensual. That was just... What they were into and they weren't hurting anybody. Actually, scratch that. John was hurting everybody, but, you know, she wasn't. So the two, they'd meet up often, you know, twice a week. Until this woman discovered John had lied to her and he wasn't divorced, as he had told her. Now, that, that was a small lie. Really, you know, in the grand scheme of things for John. But she began to become a lot more worried when John later tried to get her to detail her financial assets. Um, hey, you know, he's asking her, just give me everything you know, you know, you, you have, or let me know what you have. And then he even tried to have her sign blank papers after inviting her on a trip to Europe together. He was trying to get her signature, obviously, so he could forge it in the future. I mean, what kind of question is that? Like, just between the pegging and the spanking, he was also like, hey, listen, by the way, do you want to just list out every single thing you own? How much, how much is your house worth, your car worth, and what do you have in your bank accounts? And then, well, I'll get back to strangling you then after that. <laughs> Eventually, she lost so much trust in him that she broke things off altogether. She got away. Well, she was very, very lucky. Over the next couple of years, John fell into a modus operandi. The modus operandi he would become most known for. Using the early internet and email to connect with and manipulate his future victims. It's probably one of the earliest examples, really, we have here of internet grooming. It was also around now that he'd begun frequenting BDSM chat rooms and message boards under the moniker of Slave Master. In 1997, John used the internet and chat rooms to connect with a young woman named Isabella Lewicka. Isabella was a Polish student studying fine arts at Purdue University in North Central Indiana, where she lived with her university professor parents. Later that year, Isabella told her parents she was dropping out of her studies to accept an internship she'd been offered with a rich entrepreneur in Kansas City, Missouri. No prizes for guessing who this entrepreneur actually was. She also signed a 115, 1, 115 folks page document that was ostensibly a slave contract between herself and Robbins. Like, how much, like... What is in those 115 pages? It really must cover literally everything. And for obvious reasons, she never told her parents about any of her BDSM leanings and nothing about this contract. After moving to Kansas at the end of 1997, Isabella registered at a local community college under the name Isabella Lewicka Robinson. Oh, oh lord. And even wore a wedding ring John had given her. John? Even paid for a marriage license, though he never actually collected the papers. He put her up in an apartment in South Kansas City, and he regularly visited for some good old BDSM sessions. And John would introduce her as his niece, his adopted daughter, or even as a graphic designer working for his company. All of those things are gross. In the summer of 1998, Isabella told friends that she'd made at a local bookstore that John would be buying her books in the future, and she'd be moving away. She'd be moving pretty far away, as in, out of this world. As with several women before her, Isabella was never seen again. Unlike the others, though, her family, they didn't receive letters typed and signed. 
instead in an effort to he's moving with the times john robinson uh he sent the family multiple emails purporting to be from their daughter but he would make up various excuses as to what actually happened to her like he told one person uh, a web designer that he'd hired to work in his latest business venture that isabel had been caught smoking mary jane and so she'd been deported as a result uh, over the next few years he would continue to send emails to isabel's parents until he was finally caught years years down the line by the fall of 1999 john robinson had already zeroed in on another victim he met a 27 year old health care worker from monroe michigan named suzette troughton he met her in a bdsm chat room just as he had with isabella and again just as with his previous victim isabella john he promised her a sixty thousand dollar a year job along with near constant world travel taking care of his wheelchair-bound diabetic father. And I mean, as you can imagine, unsurprisingly, like Suzette, she couldn't afford to turn down such a lucrative and life-changing offer, and so she started making plans like immediately to move to Kansas City to take this job. And I mean, here, listen, I, it's worth noting, though, that John's father had already been dead for 10 years by this point. He died when John was in prison. So, John Robinson, he flew Suzette Troughton out to Kansas City. He picked her up at the airport in a limousine. She called home and she told her mother the job interview had gone very well, though she hadn't met, you know, his father yet, who she was supposed to be taking care of. He told her that his father had a yacht and they were planning on sailing to Hawaii and Suzette was to join them on the trip to take care of his father. Now, before her big move out to Kansas permanently, Suzette gave her mother, Carolyn, a paper, uh, some papers with John Robinson's name and phone number on it. She also hired a truck, a truck John paid for, to, to drive out her two Pekingese dogs, Harry and Pekka, from Michigan to Kansas. And, you know, once he had Suzette in Kansas City, he combined his old methods with his new ones over the next couple of weeks. He rented out a room for Suzette. He, uh, you know, kennels for her dogs, as he told them, as he told her, you know, the dogs, they couldn't come on the yacht and the apartment weren't allowed in the apartment. He then had her apply for a passport and had her sign several blank papers, which he would use to correspond with her family during the trip. As you know, you're going to be, you won't be, you'll be too busy to talk to your family. I'll write letters home for you just to let them know you're, you're getting on okay. In addition, though, he also gave her a similar slave contract to the one he'd given Isabella the year before. Another 115 pages. Suzette now had been keeping in contact with a friend named Lori through another BDSM website, and she had told her everything about Robinson, the slave contract, and her new job. Suzette was also calling her mother every day, giving her little updates and telling her how well everything was, was going. Then, one day, Robinson paid for Troughton's room, he checked her out, and he also checked the dogs out of the boarding kennels. The hotel clerk and the workers at the animal shelter... They never saw Suzette, they never saw her leave, they didn't see her collecting her dogs, they only ever saw John. Later, that very same day, Animal Control got a call from someone at the Santa Barbara Estates trailer park. Someone had left two small Pekingese dogs in a travel carrier outside the main entrance's office. Carolyn Troughton, her mother, you know, obvious, obviously already on edge and concerned about her daughter's decision to up sticks and move to Kansas out of the blue, you know, she was she was already feeling a bit worried about it, and then she didn't hear from her daughter for weeks. And so she would call John Robinson. And John told Carolyn a uh, very, very similar story. Suzette, she didn't take the job. She actually changed her mind last minute. She up up sticks and ran off with a young fella named James Turner. Some James Turner guy swept Suzette off her feet and they ran away together. Um uh... All I got was a, I got a little note, to like a postcard thing, and saying that they were, they were off on, uh, off on their adventure. We haven't heard anything in a couple of weeks, and I'm really getting nervous. Oh, um, don't, don't, you know, I wouldn't get nervous. I'm nervous. Susie always calls me, so. Well, I, from what I understand, they're, they're on a boat somewhere. It's kind of, kind of hard to call. I am really getting very nervous about this. I don't know if I should. Maybe call the police or something. Why? Well, because I haven't heard from her, and that's not well, right. Honey, she's, a, honey, she's a big girl. He even accused Suzette of stealing money from him before before she fled with this uh, with this imaginary James Turner man. Carolyn, she didn't think John Robinson's story was even slightly believable. 
And then she received several typed letters claiming to be from Suzette. Well, that just confirmed it for Caroline. At the same time, Suzette's friend Lori from the BDSM websites, she was trying to uh, get in touch with Suzette and she received the exact same bullshit story from, from John. And so Lori joined Carolyn in searching for and pressing for the police to find her friend. The two of them then began receiving emails signed from Suzette. But Carolyn knew they weren't from, actually from her daughter, who she described as being a poor speller. But the emails and all, they were mistake free, didn't sound like her daughter at all. She was convinced that John Edward Robinson had done something to her daughter. Carolyn, she then filed a missing persons report. And unlike the neighboring Overland Park PD, who had neglected to pursue any of the previous missing women and their connections to John Robinson, this wasn't going to happen this time. Suzette's case, it landed on the desk of Detective David Brown. And Detective Brown set out to thoroughly investigate Suzette's disappearance and her connection to John Robinson. And after taking one look, one simple look at, at Robinson's rap sheet and talking to detectives from Overland Park, Brown knew he was onto something. And so a task force was set up to investigate John Edward Robinson once again, including the FBI. And one of the first people, agents from this task force turned to was, once again, Stephen Hames, the very first person to catch on to Robinson's bullshit, and he was more than happy to brief this task force on his suspicions. Robinson's criminal history, which now, now was over 20 years long. Needless to say, they just decided more and more they needed to get John Edward. In the spring of 2000, John Robinson began sending money to a woman named Vicky in Texas. Vicky, she had recently lost her job and was struggling. So she was the perfect victim for a man like John Robinson. The task force, they had bugged Robinson's phone by now, and they were fully aware of his contact with Vicky. They also knew that she was planning to visit John over Easter weekend. And so they took to the neighboring hotel room and listened in on them meeting up. And, well, along with hearing some very, very uh, rough sex, Robinson also forced her into several things she was very uncomfortable with, as well as taking photographs of her while she was tied up and restrained, despite, you know, her saying, do not do that. He would also, he would hit her harder than she was ever okay with. He took her possessions that she brought with her, and he told her to return to Texas and await further instructions. Now, this incident on its own was enough to constitute sexual battery, but the agents knew there was a lot more to him than just this. And so they continued their surveillance on Robinson, watching him even more closely than they ever had been before. So he was trying to turn Vicky into like, I guess, some sort of submissive person, but it didn't last long. When he sent her back, he already moved on to the next victim. This time, John was talking, like, as you can see here, he's moving kind of quick. He's cycling through them quicker and quicker and quicker. Like this time, John had been had begun talking to a 34-year-old divorcee named Jean. And much like Vicky, Jean was from Texas. But unlike Vicky, she had no interest at all in the BDSM lifestyle. She was more lured to John by, by the offer of work. And so, John Edward Robinson, he introduced himself as James Turner. Remember, that's the name he previously conjured up in his attempt to explain away whatever happened to Suzette Troughton. So, after luring Jean in uh, with talk of employment, well, he quickly worked BDSM into their relationship, and the two laid out their individual likes and desires. This led to Robinson, who she knew as James Turner, inviting Jean to come and stay with him for a long weekend. Jean, she would accept, and the two would spend the weekend holed up in a hotel room and engage in various sexual types of intercourse, flogging, BDSM, the whole kit and caboodle. And before she went back home, before the weekend was over, she agreed that she would move to, to Kansas to work for Hydro Grow and Specialty Publications, some of his latest bullshit companies. So Jean would return to Kansas to make the move permanent. Robinson, John Robinson, he put her up in the same guesthouse suites where he had kept Suzette Tretton only a couple of months prior. And over the next few days, the couple they had sex a few times and Robinson would come and go as he pleased. Then... One day in May, Robinson called Jean and he told her, Be ready for me. He was on his way over. She should be on the floor, kneeling on all fours with her hair tied back. When John arrived, 
he was none too pleased to see she was not in the position he demanded and he set about punishing her. Things got very rough and he beat, he essentially beat the shit out of her and this was, this was way more than she ever consented to. He even started photographing her, the bruises he was giving her. Like this was far from consensual at this point. It was just a savage beating. After that, he gave her $100 and said, get out of here. Jean, in hysterics at this point, she ran down to the front desk and she tried to call the police after she was just beaten up. But she was so shaken, the desk clerk had to finish the call for her. When Jean asked for the name on the credit card that had been used to book the room, then she saw the name of the credit card was John Robinson and not James Turner. She then told the police everything. Detective David Brown, he was two months into his investigation at this point when he arrived at the guest house suites and he knew Jean. She was actually, like surprisingly, one of the lucky ones. Things then came for a head for John Robinson in June 2000 when police cars flooded into the Santa Barbara Estates in Olath and placed an apparently shocked John Robinson under arrest, taking him to the Johnson County Jail on the battery charges for Jean. At the same time, detectives and agents were executing multiple warrants on the various properties owned by John. Now, they arrested him on the on the battery charges, which, I mean, with all he's done, comparatively minor, but they did this so they could they could keep him. You can see what John's doing. He's he, like, you have to keep him away or else he will just kill more people. So they had him behind bars and began uh, searching the properties that he owned, and he owned quite a few. They took all five of his computers. They even discovered a literal paper trail when they found a piece of the paper that Lisa Stasi had signed 15 years earlier in January of 85, as well as receipts from the Roadway Hotel in Overland Park that proved he checked her out of the hotel on January 10th, right before she disappeared. The warrants, they also covered a ranch John had bought 30 miles away from his home. At that ranch, the final nail was hammered into Robinson's reign of terror with the discovery of two 55-gallon oil drums. Inside the drums were the decomposing bodies of Suzette Troughton and Isabella Lewicka. The things couldn't get even more grim. Police carried out a further search at a storage facility in Missouri where they found three more of those 55-gallon drums. You probably have a good idea what's coming. Inside the bodies were Sheila, Nandebi Faith, and Beverly Bonner. Legal proceedings finally started against John Edward Robinson with a preliminary hearing on the 5th of February 2001. He was charged with two counts of first degree murder for the killings of Isabella and Suzette, two counts of fraud, over 50 forgery charges, one count of aggravated kidnapping in Suzette's case, as well as multiple charges already brought a year earlier relating to Beverly Bonner and the Fates. Robinson ultimately stood trial for seven felony charges, including three capital murder cases that each carried the death penalty. It wouldn't conclude until January 2003, when John Edward Robinson was found guilty on all counts, and he was sentenced to life in prison and also two death sentences. Which I'm kind of, does that kind of cancel each other out then? So it's like zero death sentences. Well, one of those death sentences, along with the life sentence, was actually overturned on a technicality by the Kansas Supreme Court. The death sentence, though, for Isabella Luica, that, that still stands. In October 2003, knowing that they couldn't prove that Robinson had killed all the women, authorities agreed to a deal with Robinson that amended to a, to a guilty plea and another life sentence for Robinson. But it did mean he would avoid further death penalty cases, however. So... To this day, John Robinson is still on death row at the El Dorado Correctional Facility in Kansas, and that is where we leave him. A truly terrifying, manipulative piece of work. And by work, I mean shit. The bodies of Paula Godfrey, Lisa Stasi, and Catherine Clampett still, to this day, have not been recovered. And Robinson, he's he hasn't mentioned recovering them. He simply doesn't seem to give a shit. Um, he's a totally, you know, unremorseful serial killer, like a pure criminal who lasted years. And who, the problem I have really with this case is he just got away with it for so long. With all the shit he pulled, he was able to still do, 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 skipping down the road, having a grand old time. It's like, it's amazing. But 
at the same time, when he had no consequences to what he did, it's not surprising he steadily, steadily just got more and more violent. The legal system never cared what he was doing until the very end, and many lives were absolutely ruined beyond repair. Thank you so much for listening. Um, it really means the world to me. Thank you. I, I don't think I'll ever be able to thank you enough for, for just all the love and support I'm getting. Um, really, means a lot to me. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the episode. Really, really crazy one. Um, another serial killer. It's I'm always amazed. Like, I, I didn't really know anything about John Edward Robinson before I started looking into this. But yeah, wow, what a guy. It's, it, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any shortage of John Edward Robinsons out there. So I'm sure there'll be some more coming up very, very soon. But until the next one, podcast Mondays and Fridays, videos every Tuesdays. I'll see you when I see you next, I guess. Um, but you know, you know what's up. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves because I love you. Mike out. <laughs>